Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at c a c h e f l y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Shutterstock dot com with over nine hundred thousand high quality video clips. Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For thirty percent off your new account, go to Shutterstock dot com and use offer code Frame Rate Four. Welcome to episode 120 of Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. If you can hear me over this iPad connection from St. Louis, just outside of my show. A uh, little damper on the festivities uh, today. Uh, if you have been following the news, you know, uh, just a couple hours ago as we're recording this show, uh, two explosions at the Boston Marathon in Boston. Not our place to cover it on this show, but we do want to acknowledge that it happened uh, and express our sympathies to those apparently at least two dead, several uh, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds injured uh, there. If you are looking for information about this, go go to the news sources. If you're watching us live, go check those out. We will make the show available on demand. That's why it's at twit.tv slash FR. Uh, if you're looking for family members, 617-635-4500 is the phone number for that. If you have information, the number is 800-494-TIPS. There's a Google person finder out there as well. It's being crowdsourced, a Red Cross person finder. And, of course, it's always important to give blood at times like these, redcross.org. We're not going to try to put a tech angle on these events, but we did want to acknowledge them and, as I said, express our sympathies. Uh, and the rest of the show is just going to be a normal frame rate show. So... Brian? Starting with... Shall we bring in our guests? Yeah. Oh, wait, yes. I, I was just going to jump right into the big story and just have them sit there awkwardly. <laughs> it's a uh, much better us. idea. Let's bring him in. <laughs> from uh, This Week in Geek, the founder of ThisWeekinGeek.net, uh, we're happy to have Steve Saylor uh, from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. How's it going, Steve? I'm doing excellent. How about you guys? We're doing well. Thanks for joining us today. Also, because it was the premiere of his brand new show on the Twit Network uh, just yesterday, This Week in YouTube's host, comedy, comedic vlogger Lamar Wilson. How's it going, Lamar? Doing great. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Jam-packed right. with guests, and we start with the big story. This just in, the big story. Brian, we cannot get away from this. Uh, it's Aereo and the Great Bluff. Uh, now, it, it just keeps getting Unpiz bigger. Okay, so uh, I, I don't know if I just had a Skype hic hiccup or what, but the thing that drives me nuts about these guys claiming that they're going to go subscription only is, number one, like, we got word that people, after last week, they pointed out that they had all kinds of uh, NFL contracts that demanded that they carry locally. Is that correct? Well, we, we heard some stuff like that. Then we also heard uh, we heard people say, well, they could get around that by doing live streaming like they do with the Super Bowl. So what we're hearing now is that uh, Fox affiliates say we're on board with the plan to move to pay TV. We would just have a separate signal for anything that we're required to broadcast over the air by our FCC license. And we would all the primetime stuff would go to cable. And I, I guess they would be fine with that. CBS saying we would look at this, uh, too. Uh, and meanwhile, Aereo full speed ahead is, is marketing like crazy and looking ready to start new markets. So the uh, when when they send their signal to local cable providers, they the cable companies have to charge a fee and they, they get paid. The affiliates get paid by the cable companies to rebroadcast. Is that correct? Yeah. Remember, we've gone over the it's kind of it's kind of complicated. There's a must carry law. That right. confuses the issue that says the cable companies have to carry you if you want them to. Or, as a local channel in the U.S., after the 1994 Act, you can opt out of must carry and then bargain for them to pay you. Okay. So uh, here's what, what I'm getting at is what drives me nuts is when we first talked about this story, they were so offended that Aereo was, was I'm using air quotes here, stealing their signal, rebroadcasting it without paying a license, then that they're so upset by it that they're going to take their ball and go home was, was what it sounded like to us. But now it sounds different. Now it sounds like, well, if Aereo is going to exist, 
it's not fair that that apparently consumers are comfortable paying seven, eight, nine dollars a month in order to get clear signal, uh, and we're not the ones getting that seven, eight, and nine dollars. So now it sounds much less like them, uh, like them saying like someone is ripping off our signal. Now it just sounds like uh, like they're saying, well, if there's money to be had, then we want it, and so we're going to go subscription based then. Well, yeah, and, and, and essentially they're, they, they want to pr protect that money. They don't want people to go to Aereo and not get a cut of what Aereo has. So there, there's two escape routes here. One is they strike a deal with Aereo for licensing, and the other is they go to Congress and get Aereo's exception ruled out. It, that is if Aereo wins the court case, which still has to happen now, why, yet. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they immediately start working with Aereo? Uh, because they don't want to, uh, they they don't want to piss off the cable MSOs. Remember, the cable people are out there going, "Don't you dare strike a deal with Aereo. We are the monopoly in every region that delivers your local channels uh, to people." So you you want to you you want to maintain this relationship with us because we've got all your other channels that you broadcasters have. Because remember, all these broadcasters have multiple cable channels as well as their big broadcast channel. Yeah. Well, they're jerks, all of them. <laughs> Lamar, <laughs> the what you, the have you have you been following this? I have, and I I just a couple of thoughts. I think this is pretty ridiculous because number one, I don't see how they are going to lose money on, on this. It's just someone else producing the feed. I'll give you an example from my place that I have here in, in L.A. Uh, when I was in Chicago, I had a over the air antenna get every, you know, major local channel. Here at this particular place, I can't get it just because of where my apartment is. And so a service like this would make sense. The, uh, Fox and CBS would not lose any money. I will still be watching them, but I can finally get a signal, even if it goes over the internet, because I can't put an antenna out here and get, and get the signal that I'm supposed to get for free. I, I just, I cannot wrap my head around why every time a new technolo technology comes out, they feel like they have to get some extra money out of it or they're going to lose out of it if someone else provides a well, better and that's service. that's the weird part because, yeah. like, Aereo's only crime is providing value and making the pie bigger. And they're sitting there just watching Aereo provide a service that people want, and they're just so mad that, that, they're, that they can't have it that they're going to shut it all down. It's, well, the, don't, don't forget that they make less money off the over-the-air viewers than they make off the cable viewers, right? Because they can get the fee and sell the ads to the cable viewers. So what sure. they're seeing with Aereo is eating into that money pie that they actually, they're willing to tolerate those fading number of people with rabbit ears as, as long as that number keeps declining. But if Aereo comes in and starts making that go number go back up, then their business model's screwed. But, but Steve, this must look crazy to, from, to you from Canada, right? Oh, you crazy Americans. Um, it Basically, the way I, I see it, like, I, I have not had uh, actual TV in my home because the same thing as Lamar. I just My apartment just doesn't get a proper signal. So being able to uh, watch live TV, that is the only crux of everything that uh, I, everything I watch online is, like, I want to watch everything online. I want to be able to watch it on my own and watching live programming, like say the Super Bowl or any live sort of award show, that kind of thing. I don't, I, I don't have that access, but having a service like Aereo, I would love that. Uh, the problem is at least here in Canada is that generally whenever you guys get something first, we have to wait about a couple of months to years to when we can finally catch up. Uh, but it's it, it, like a man. I, if I if they had this service day one in Canada, I would sign up in a heartbeat. Yeah, you know, there's always so, a VPN. I'm just saying. So I got I got yeah. a quick question. Uh, well, we, there, there's there's ways of getting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, my my quick question is, Tom, for what you were saying, are there different ads that are run on the local Fox that's over the air than the one on the cable company? Because yeah. it, it seems like if there's ads, they're still getting money. That's yeah, I'm but the, but on the cable company, they get money from the cable company for carrying the channel in a lot of cases. Okay. In addition to the money they're it's, getting for the ads, it's it's just like the Hulu Plus thing. Like Hulu Plus, you pay a monthly sh service and you still get ads. It's it's you know when you once you've tasted that double dip income, it's very difficult for your you know for your networks to want to give that up. Oh, so they're just being greedy. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right there. Our country is built on. Now I don't know. I don't know if you got what you guys have uh, in the states, but what we do is uh, like we don't have anything sort of live streaming over uh, uh, over the web, obviously uh, in Canada. But what we have is that for each sort of major network channel, 
uh, like CTV or City TV or Global TV, um, it, you can be able to get an actual iPhone app and be able to stream all their programming. And they just sort of cut in every time there's a commercial break with an actual ad, uh, similar to what you guys have with uh, with Hulu. It just it's it each channel or each network has their own individual app that we can be able to get. And personally, I would prefer that if if say NBC, CBS, or Fox uh, had their or I don't know if you guys have it the, their own individual app. I would like. Like, I don't need to have live streaming TV. I can just watch the shows on there. Well, the one thing I, I can tell you, no matter what happens, when you have big, big organizations, don't forget, Ario's backed by Barry Diller. He's a, he's a legend in, in the entertainment industry. So you've got big people fighting. It that usually means the consumers win in the end uh, because you've got lots of battles up at the top. It's, all, it's when the big companies all get along that, that we end up losing out. And there's a smaller company that's making waves called Dish Network, and they're making some news today. That's another big story. Oh. Ooh. It's another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. So Dish is doing two things. One uh, is they've got a pile of cash that they're looking to do stuff with. Don't forget, these are the guys who made the hopper which uh, automatically records all of primetime television and then 24 hours later allows you to watch it without commercials automatically without having to use your fast-forward button. That's why CBS told CNET they couldn't give the Best of CES award to the Dish Hopper because they're mad about that. Earlier this last week, Bloomberg Business Week reported that Dish might be looking at making a bid on T-Mobile in order to get into the cellular game. And then today, DealBook at New York Ooh. Times reports that Dish is making a $25.5 billion bid for Sprint Nextel. SoftBank, Japanese company, looked like a lock to buy Sprint Nextel, and Dish comes wading in with their big money bags and saying, like, you know what, actually, we'd like to do this. Well, and this is huge. The moment I heard this this morning, the, it, it seemed perfect because, you know, Sprint is your, your third-place carrier that is because – they're in third place. They're making bold decisions like, uh, you know, unlimited data. Yes, for reals, unlimited. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, Dish, of course, being a third place, I assume, or fourth place uh, provider, is able to do outrageous stuff like the hopper. Once, if those two were to team up <laughs> and that culture of taking big risks were to continue, I could see all kinds of deals where it's like if you have Dish, uh, dish without the dish, basically, all, every single channel, all on your phone, available at any time. And I don't know how much of that is possible with their current agreements, but it's pretty clear that they don't mind uh, that. That certainly the dish side of thing doesn't mind ruffling some feathers, but uh, in a very pro-consumer stance. So uh, I, I, this could be great. It could. It could be right. I mean, we 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 look at this and you say, well, obviously the television networks are never going to allow a, a cell company to stream things over the internet. On the other hand, if you look 20 years down the road, the idea is, well, maybe eventually we just get rid of over-the-air broadcasting altogether, TV, radio, and everything, and everything is just wireless internet so that you can get whatever information you want. This 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 could be a baby step down that road. Lamar, am I, am I crazy talking? No, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think Brian is right. My problem has always been with Dish. I do not like them. Uh, I don't. I didn't like when they had to fight with TiVo. I didn't like when they got Slingbox uh, because it just seemed like things just went bad uh, on those services that, that that I liked or the you know the legal battles they had with with TiVo. I know Sprint needs to be under someone. They're they're not doing that well in the U.S. I just I'm not sure if Dish is the company to to come and and save them. But you're spot on about having everything on online wireless. Get rid of the middleman. Get rid of the over the air and just have everything on the internet. It's, it's going to go there eventually. The, is, is Dish the company? I'm not sure. Steve, what do you think? Is Dish the company? Uh, yeah, I think it could be. Uh, it has a definite uh, sort of gravitas towards it, I guess. Uh, but I mean, at least in Canada, we like there, every sort of thing is made uh, is owned by the big three. There's Bell, Rogers, and Shaw, and they kind of already have this in place. Uh, they own they. You can buy a, a cell phone plan and, and a TV plan and a phone plan through through them, and they also provide like their own sort of services for online streaming video. Like especially Rogers, they have their own app that you can be able to. As long as you're a Rogers TV subscriber, you can be able to watch all their programming on there. Um, so I think that definitely uh, this is a step in the right direction. 
Mm. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Shutterstock.com. This episode of Frame Rate brought to you by Shutterstock. You'll find the perfect image or video for your next creative project at Shutterstock, whether it's for your website, whether it's a publication, an advertisement, you're making a commercial, just a documentary, any kind of video. They've got, you might think Shutterstock, right? I know they've got great clip art. They've got over 900,000 high quality stock video clips, 2D and 3D. They've got animation. They've got motion graphics in there. They have clips in a variety of digital formats. Most of them come in HD. And the cool thing about Shutterstock is they source their video clips from around the world and put them at your fingertips. So many of the contributors are professional filmmakers and animators. You can use their work legally in your work. Shutterstock curates this stuff. They review each video individually for content with loving care before they add it to their library. But they do a lot of them. They're adding over 10,000 video clips a week. So every time you visit, you're definitely going to find something new. And they give you video content you need to bring your creative projects to the next level. Uh, you can search by category. You can search by resolution, by contributor. If you start to find somebody like, I really like their shots, you can find them. And a shareable clip box. So you can access them anytime and share with your team members. They also have a huge image library. We talk about that all the time. Photos, vectors, icons, infographic templates, all that good stuff. I use that stuff on It's a Thing all the time. Shutterstock has flexible pricing too. You can choose between individual clips or if you're going to be using a lot of stuff, you might want to get a video pack. You can download clips in HD or you can buy standard definition or web formats. If it's if it's just for a web video, why, why spend the bandwidth that you don't need to? Shutterstock is a complete global offering. They have offices located in more than a dozen companies, Germany, China, and let, let, look for cats. Just look for cats and you'll be impressed. You might think, well, I can find cats on the internet. They got some impressive cats there at Shutterstock. Oh, can, I actually, uh, can I actually mention something? Sure. I actually, uh, I will say this. I am a big proponent of uh, Shutterstock. I work for a radio station. I'm, uh, I'm, I call myself the blind graphic designer because I am one. Uh, and I use Shutterstock all the time for uh, all the projects I work for in the, uh, uh, at the radio stations I work at. So, I so when you say you use it for the radio, you're putting video on the web or images on the web? Uh, mostly images, uh, definitely like because I'm the I'm the digital content producer there. So everything that goes on the web right. is, is all done through me. So everything because I know uh, there's like, some smart aleck out there going like, well, radio. What do you need images for? But it's the kind of website. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> and we we keep saying that radio is going to die eventually soon. But uh, <laughs> like, I, I know I still have a job. <laughs> That's all I know. <laughs> That's right. You're on the right side of that equation. Uh, we'll try exactly. Shutterstock today, folks. To so sign up for a free account, you don't need a credit card or anything to just try it out. Start an account, begin using Shutterstock, help them. Imagine what your next project could be like. Save some video selections. Get yourself some job security like Steve Saylor. Uh, stay, save some stuff to a clip box. And then if you do decide to purchase, use the offer code FRAMERATE4. And new accounts, get this, receive 30% off any package. So don't forget that. Shutterstock.com. For 30% off new accounts, use the offer code FRAMERATE4. And we really thank Shutterstock for their support of FRAMERATE. Let us move on to the slipstream. So, uh, appropriate uh, story to have along with the uh, host of This Week in YouTube with us. YouTube for iOS gets access uh, to some new stuff now, which means you can airplay it over your Apple TV. Live streams, uh, your subscriptions feed, and video queuing. So, you could load up a bunch of clips, airplay them, sit back, and just watch some television. What do you, what do you think of this, Lamar? Yeah, I, I like that, that airplay type of thing. You, you pretty much can uh, queue up and even in, in, I believe, in off, some kind of offline mode and just watch it when you want to. Uh, I like the live stream uh, support. I believe Android has this now. The one thing they updated, and I'm using air quotes like Brian did earlier, uh, with the subscription aerial thing. Quotes, yeah, perhaps. aerial quotes that, that I don't like uh, is that this, it used to just say home feed, like it shows in a picture. Now it's, it has two sections, what to watch, which is your default always. You can never change it. And your subscription fee, which means if you want to watch your subscriptions first, there's one extra step that you'll have to take. And, of course, that hurts content creators as myself because their YouTube is pushing out things that they think you might want to watch versus things that you actually mm -hmm. subscribe to. And so it's... It's a, it's a bummer. I wish they wouldn't enforce that on people, but I know why they do it. It's it's just to keep the stream of different content coming to someone who wants to just watch videos for like 10 minutes if they're in a grocery line. But Comcast, yeah, overall, it's great. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's cool. Comcast uh, confirmed that they will now start encrypting basic cable 
Uh, they have alerted their customers in some markets that it will now encrypt basic cable signals, forcing them to order a digital adapter if they want to continue to receive basic program through the service. This was something that a lot of uh, cord shavers were doing. It was like cutting out all but the most basic subscription to Comcast, and then you could get the basic channels through any wire in your house. Brian, I mean, this was awesome. Well, and yeah, and I, what I don't understand, it's like, it's this is their service. Like, was the consumer doing something like stealing, watching channels that they weren't supposed to? Or I guess their problem was that people could hook up as many TVs throughout the, the house problem, as they wanted. Right, consumers were watching channels without paying an extra fee to rent a box. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're just going to have to pay a rent. So is this really, are they going to have to pay for the box now? They're just deciding everyone needs a box? Well, yes and no. I mean, this actually leads into uh, one of our other stories uh, in, in, in when we get to tube tops. But certain boxes, like Boxy Box, are able to decrypt. So right. you, you can still buy your own box, but you still need a box. That's the, that's the key. Okay. Uh, well, it's more st uh, whatever. I mean, like, what what can you do? I mean, it's like this is like griping about the post office being slow. You know, newsflash. You know, Comcast wants more money. Consumers not going to have a better experience as a result. I mean, this right? It's tax day. Can you believe yes, they took taxes? Apparently, it's busy at the at the at the post office. Uh, now we were talking about Aereo and how they've. They've so far won in court. They've avoided an injunction. Uh, the judges say had said on the face of it, it doesn't look like this is illegal to rent out an antenna and then stream it to an individual. However, a Los Angeles federal court disagreed, and they're ordering a halt to a startup company called Aereo Killer, uh, which is started by someone named Alki David. You may be familiar with him uh, as the creator of Filmon. Uh, an attempt to stream all kinds of internet channels uh, onto an iPad app and over the internet without permission. Uh, he, is, he has gone after CBS in the past, so I think he probably decided to do Aereo Killer because CBS was mad about Aereo. Uh, and he was providing local stations via remote digital antennas, but not geofencing them. That was the significant difference. Still, in the U.S. District Court in L.A., they noted the other Aereo case in the Second Circuit Court, and said, cases there have held that where a transmission of a work over the Internet is made from a copy of a work made at the direction of and solely for the use by a single user, there is no public transmission. But the L.A. court disagreed, said we think that is a copy, and therefore that's a copyright infringement. So th this thing, uh, uh, okay, well, I mean, I don't even know where to begin on, on this one. Uh, the distinction is, uh, forget it, I got nothing, I got nothing. <laughs> Steve, does, does it excited. make any sense to you? Um, uh, no, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> it, essentially, let me try to break it down. You've got the Second <laughs> Circuit Court looking at Aereo, and they haven't, they haven't actually gone through the full trial yet, but they're saying, look, on the face of it, we don't think having an antenna sending a signal over an internet, the internet to one person is a public performance. And therefore, there's nothing illegal here on the face of it. We still have to go to trial, but we're not going to put an injunction out. In L.A., you have a court saying, actually, we think that's a public performance because the internet is public. So even if so, it's only okay. going to one person, but that's a public this performance. Guy's set up. This setup, this guy, and, and by the way, nice nice jerk move calling it Aereo Killer, just so, that, just so we can muddy the waters of this even more. So uh, Aereo Killer is essentially a straight-up ripoff of exactly what Aereo is doing, only he didn't geofence. And Correct. that's the difference? As or I just, understand it, that's the only difference. Mm -hmm. Or just the courts in... Uh, or the courts in L.A. just have a different opinion. Now, keep in mind, L.A. Both is, of, those of course... Are true. A big, he didn't geofence, but right. then the L.A. court also ruled that we think this is a public performance. Huh. All right. I, got, I mean, I got nothing, man. This, this yeah. is just going to get nastier and nastier. It's definitely not precedent setting for the second district court. So this might all end up having to get worked out in the Supreme Court at some point. Uh, but we'll keep an eye on it. Let's go to Tube Tops. Uh, so Boxy, as I mentioned, uh, they have the Boxy uh, DVR that allows you to uh, record in unlimited amounts in the cloud, but it's only in certain markets because they're trying to limit the bandwidth that they're using. They're going to roll it out to more marks at markets. Abner Ronan said so, uh, and they're starting to do that. But they've also changed the name. It's no longer Boxy TV. It's Boxy Cloud DVR, and they're de-emphasizing. They haven't changed 
the capability of the box, but they're de-emphasizing that free TV revolutionary aspect of it. Yeah, I actually am okay with this. Of course, what makes this newsworthy is what? It's like four months ago this thing came out, and then they're already rebranding it. And the big change is from calling it Boxy TV to Boxy Cloud DVR. Uh, I think it's a legitimate reason to rename it because I did always think of Boxy as a streaming device like a Roku. But when it can do so much more, like with the Cloud DVR, you know, then if you're having a problem of getting that through to customers, uh, my guess is that they also looked and saw that the market for DVRs is probably a lot bigger than the market for streaming boxes. So you want to compete on that bigger playing field. Uh, so so this, that all makes sense to me. It's a little bit of a bummer to see them de-emphasizing what made them great. You feel like, you know, they're getting a little cozy, obviously, because we're, we're talking about the, um, uh, what's that What's that encryption thing that they got a, they, they got a little special handshake deal uh, with the with the cable providers. Right, uh, so right. Even when basic cable is encrypted or whatever. I would imagine that there's a lot of this in like, all right, Boxy, you're not going away. Let's let's at least cozy up and, and be friendly. And I'm not saying any kind of like nefarious backroom deals. I'm just saying if you want to get something done, you know, you do some give and take and you you change your tone. So Boxy's mm -hmm. getting a little less punk rock. They're putting on a nice suit. They're combing their hair, uh, hoping to uh, to, I assume, getting a lot more homes. So you're saying Boxy's all grown up? A little bit. <laughs> Makes me a yeah. little bit sad. They were pretty punk back in the day. Yeah, but you know what? They've got that. They've always got that root. That they've always got that part of them. Can't deny it. Sure. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm in the um, the market. I, th I believe it's in the LA market uh, for this. My only. As I was reading a lot of comments on this, and one of the, I guess, unsettling things about Boxy is that they keep changing or they'll lose they lose support they stop support on a product and so i'm i'm afraid if i buy, go buy this right now will i be left in the dark a few months if they decide to change their gears again so yeah. uh it, i don't know what to think about that that's it, always yeah, the the worry right when you're relying on a cloud service mm -hmm. yeah i always had the same thing with uh, like pretty much any uh, major streaming box whether it's the roku or the boxy uh, like i tried a whole bunch of them and they just didn't they some functionalities worked, some functionalities didn't now granted some of that was because uh, i was in canada and then some some things just didn't work but still sure. there was a lot of other functionalities that things get taken away and eventually i had to settle on an apple tv because it just worked right out of the box and it's uh pun intended uh and it just i i absolutely love it like the, the apple tv TV is hands down my favorite out of all of them. Well, Microsoft wants to change your mind, Steve, because they're nice. going to introduce a whole bunch of new features to the Xbox that'll make it the one set-top box you need, except for that other set-top box you need to decode your cable signal. But the Xbox <laughs> will control that box, so you'll forget it's even there because everything will be piped through the Xbox. This is actually the way the Google TV works. Everything is piped through and controlled by HDMI. So what they're, what they're telling the Verge, sources are, is that the Xbox will require an online connection to use the entertainment service, not the video games, allowing them to be always on for streaming and access to TV signals and you'll be able to say I want to watch this show and they'll say oh it's it's on your cable service on this channel it's on demand uh, cable on this channel it's also on Netflix here and you'll get all of that in one interface okay so here's the thing Tom uh, this is almost exactly what we hoped Google TV would do um, mm -hmm. so I'm very excited I just wonder if it'll actually be that, you know? And it's like, and I thought, you know, we've talked about this on the show before. Uh, Xbox is a tremendous amount of hardware sitting in living rooms all over the place. This makes a lot of sense. Universally, all these people, uh, it's the babysitter problem, right? It's the fact that when their babysitter comes over, you got to explain how to get which thing on which gizmo and to switch which thing. If they can solve that problem and crack that code and have a beautiful interface, that makes it, again, as we say on the show, easy to watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it then then they'll make all the money in the world they'll they'll win all the dollars but i just don't i don't know i've been burned so many times i agree i've been burned several times i know uh, i sort of gauge the barometer with my mom my mom she loves watching survivor on tv and she can never seem to find it no matter what box she's using uh whether it's the xbox the the, the ps3 or, or just the our dvr cable box and uh, I mean, it's just every single thing we try over top of that, uh, like I always have to use the phrase that my, t that my teacher once told me, polish a turd, it's still a turd. Uh, so being able to put a slick interface over top of it, it still doesn't work the way I want it to. So I'm hoping that the Xbox will be able to do it. 
Does it drive you nuts when you walk into the room and your parents are watching like the standard definition version of a channel that you know oh, you're paying yes. to get in HD? Oh my lord, like, yes. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I, oh. I'm like, I, t- I tell my mom all the time, it's like, okay, you know, there's much better quality of uh, uh, like uh, uh, channels on here, and she's like, yeah, but I only know how to work this one remote, and that's the only remote I'm going to use, and I'm like, it. Uh. Uh, my 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 grandma's solution for that, I'm watching like. A channel on ABC in regular definition, which she clearly had high definition, was to was to stretch it. And she's like, "Look, Lamar, I'm watching it HD." I was like, "God, no, oh, yeah. no. <laughs> no." My father-in-law, same thing. Same thing. Uh, my dad yeah. the same thing, but he does it, does it with movies. He can't stand the black bars, so he'll constantly zoom in to everything. And I'm like, "No, what are you doing? Please, God, no, stop it! <laughs> You're mangling the picture." Uh, well. <laughs> You can't do that with a Roku, but uh, that's still got a babysitter problem of its own. However, they've sold 5 million of these things. They've streamed 8 billion videos and music tracks, but they are shutting down Video Buzz, which was one of the ways you could sneak YouTube yeah. onto Roku. Have you, uh, were, you, uh, were you aware of the Video Buzz, Lamar? I, I didn't hear Video Buzz. There was one private channel that was right before this when I had a Roku, and I forget what it was called, but it was abruptly shut down a few months later by YouTube, and I knew it would happen again. It must be some licensing issue that Roku's not willing to pay Google for this. I because don't have it, any. Of, my I, my wife yeah. works for YouTube, but I don't have any inside knowledge about this. Uh, my guess yeah. is that they because this has been the problem with apps sometimes is they want the ability to stream ads in a certain way, and if the platform can't handle it, then they won't authorize an app for it. It's my guess that that's what's going on with Roku. That's it, it's Roku interesting, ever, but the, go ahead. Oh no! So I say, has Roku ever had like it's uh, like the actual YouTube channel? Because I remember having a Roku XD a couple of years ago, and I was able to stream YouTube just fine, and never got rid of, uh, and never it was on there for about a year or so that uh, that I used it for. There were unofficial versions of it. I don't know if there's ever been an actual uh, official version. I, there might have been in the early days. I could be wrong about that, but yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure all of those were unofficial. That the ad thing makes me wonder what you say, Tom, because I have Apple TV. And it looks, uh, YouTube looks great in there, but it, it doesn't look any different from watching Netflix on there. And I and I don't, I never see ads in it. Versus if I go to my Xbox, I do see the ads in there. So yeah. I, I wonder if, if you know what kind of deal maybe Apple has to to get well, that and in there. They struck that Apple deal a long time ago, so it may That's have been true. before they started paying attention as as closely. Absolutely. Uh, Meanwhile, this one's tailor-made for you, Steve. Eight percent of Canadians now cord cutters who no longer watch traditional television. Uh, that's uh, double what it was in 2007, six years ago. Yeah, actually, it's uh, it's interesting. Like, I, I every sort of one of my friends in, in Toronto, they like they don't ha- subscribe to any regular cable service. They are getting it all through uh, on the air or or uh, like just online through Netflix or whichever. Um, there's even sort of a big uh, thing of it's sort of a big movement to be able to have access to American uh, stations and Netflix and stuff like that. Uh, we, there, we, there's two services that are sort of competing. There's called Unblock US and Blockless, where for uh, a five bucks a month, you can just change the DNS uh, uh, address on your router and everything in your house can be able to have access to uh, American uh, content. Uh, I use it all the time for Netflix and it just makes it look like, oh, I'm traveling in the U.S. And uh, you guys, like, like I... I U.S. is basically like the like the, the wonderful Emerald City of Oz to us because in regards to content because we don't, you guys have so much stuff that we just want to be able to to watch well, and, sure, and, and then we have, get all whiny because we can't catch like the latest BBC show uh, and then and start <laughs> hey. standing our feet. Well, and so and so, so well, you here's, know what I mean. Here's my question: uh, the okay, so you've got uh, like there are governmental regulations and laws that says so much of our of our broadcast television content has to be Canadian made. We don't want to be you know America's hat or whatever you know things. So you, you sort of create this gray market where you have all this content in America, and of course, America, your Netflix is blocked if you're in Canada for you know X, Y, and Z purposes or at times and so on. Um, and you get all these people who learn these workarounds, and you have these serv- services that exist only to create weaseliness. Uh, and I, I would love to know if there are any studies on piracy of video content in Canada versus in the United States, because by creating this this normalized, uh, you know, uh, weasel market, basically, it makes me wonder if it's like, well, if you're already 
weaseling to get, you know, pretend like you're in the United States in order to watch U.S. television. Uh, you know, Game of Thrones, ah, just grab it, Pirate Bay or whatever. Like, have you – can you speak uh, – I you don't need to out any of your friends or anything, but uh, is there anything to that, do you think? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, there has like being able to, uh, get some, uh, like American content or just content that we just can't get in Canada that we would love to be able to get. And we would, fr we would no problem be pay legally to get access to this content. Um, we, we just sort of go, which whatever means are available uh, to us. And one of the things that uh, we've sort of uh, seen is, uh, that I think I remember reading a study or something like that, that uh, Canada is probably one of the most pirate. Uh, countries in the world uh, in regards to being able to have access to uh, to content. Uh, and the thing is, like, they're actually the government uh, of Canada does add certain things here and there. There actually was uh, for a period of time uh, back when sort of the MP3s and uh, Napster sort of was a big thing. They actually put a, uh, a small tax on every single uh, CD uh, R or, C or burnable CD that, uh, that you purchase. And that goes to the government to be able to pay out to uh, to the uh, the the RIA equivalent, uh, and it would so that that way the artist can still be able to get money off of burning CDs because, and it, it was very minuscule and it wasn't really not, not noticeable. And it's sort of when I talk to people about that, they're like, "Oh, what, really? That that actually happened?" It's like, "Yeah," but it wasn't that it wasn't that huge of a deal. So I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't put it past uh, the least the government of Canada to, to have something maybe put something in place that we can be able to still get uh, a content outside of Canada. Also, well, Steve, as far as I understand it, by law in Canada, when you uh, start to pirate a file, you have to say, really sorry about the piracy. <laughs> no, uh, actually, uh, you, if, you, if you read the exact letter everything. of the law, it's you have to say, sorry about the piracy. Ooh, eh? sorry. Yeah, so, sorry, eh? we have to, we apologize for <laughs> stealing your content, eh? Well, and let's, then, let's see, I was going to say, Steve, this never would have happened if you all had not canceled Flashpoint, one of the greatest shows ever uh, that's oh, Canadian-based. You know what? It was you guys. <laughs> you stole you stole our content by putting it on <laughs> networks, and that just show up. That. I love <laughs> that show. It's all karma. It all goes around. <laughs> all right, let's get into will... some film film. <laughs> Just a couple of things in Film Found today. These are the, the stuff that we like to watch. Uh, we got a first little look at the Japanese live-action Gachaman movie, uh, G-Force for those Anglophiles out there, or Battle of the Planets, perhaps you might know it as. Uh, first look at the Science Ninja team. Not much, just just kind of them and their helmets, but they look a lot more badass than the bird-looking people from the from the cartoons, which I totally loved. Yeah, but, yeah, you got to immediately cover your ass on that one. Yeah, and I did. I absolutely love G-Force. Uh, dude, uh, this next story, and I'm upset that I can't see anything uh, because of my internet connection being on the road, but this second story with the with the sci-fi announcement of Childhood's End, that is, like, easily my all-time favorite uh, Arthur C. Clarke book. Yeah, Larry Niven's Ringworld and Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood End are going to be made into, what, miniseries? Is that right? For sci-fi? But but uh, sci-fi making sci-fi is well, unheard it's, of. It's, it's an odd home for science fiction content to be on uh, network sci-fi. Weird, them weird, as weird thing. A wrestling channel. It's good for, it's good for them to. What is, you know, what is this? Out. What is this sci-fi or sci-fi you speak of? Because we have an actual sta a channel called Space that you know. I'm just saying it, it's. Better. Yeah, but where do you put Lord of the Rings? Because that doesn't happen in space. <laughs> it could. I guess we work science. around that. <laughs> Pretty really amazing. Not. I would totally watch the hell out of Lord of the Rings in space. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared <laughs> of watching anything on on Sci-Fi Man because you get into these series and they they're just notorious for canceling and and that's just the worst thing. Just you you get it you get emotionally invested and and they rip it from you. So I'm hoping that if these are miniseries that they they they're short and they 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 end well and they don't try to stretch them out and then take it away from you. Didn't they try to do this a couple of years ago, though? I remember hearing something about uh, uh, sci-fi wanted to be able to make a miniseries off of these shows. Uh, I, off of these particular ones? Because they've done, you know, they've done Dune in cooperation with, mm -hmm. with other networks around the world. And, and they've, they've done uh, Pern. I think they did some Dragon Rider stuff. But I don't remember these particular ones. Maybe they have been in development for a while. Mm. I don't, I'm going to take a blind leap here. I don't know if we have an opening for it or not. But it's time to, to cover the first week of the summer movie draft. Bow, 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 movie draft. 
<laughs> That's yeah, right. It's a summer movie draw. Uh, so this week it's Oblivion. It's Brian Brushwood's movie. Uh, what do you? What's your odds? Uh, Tom Cruise and Morgan Freeman. Uh, well, obviously, big star power. Uh, the early part of the reason I paid as much as I did for Oblivion was uh, banking on it's projected to do 140 to 160 million. It might maybe a little bit less now, down to 120. Uh, but the stuff I had seen like six months ago had me super pumped. But the way they're marketing it now, it just looks like the Matrix light. You got this this faux Morpheus thing happening, and I'm actually less confident in it now than I was when I bought it. So we'll we'll see. But I'm just so glad that the game's starting, man. It's uh it's gonna be an awesome ride this whole summer. Mm-hmm. Yes, best of luck. I'm actually gonna see this movie one way or another. I don't yeah, care if it's good it. or not. Sure. I'm a sucker for a space movie. Same here. Let let's move on to what we're watching. What we're watching. Uh, we will uh, go. We will, of course, start with our guests and uh, our most distant guest first, Steve Saylor. What have you been watching these days? Um, I have been watching uh, Doctor Who and Game of Thrones. Uh, it is uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, I also am watching. I don't know if you guys have uh, checked out the show Elementary. Um, it is, uh, it, it's sort of like uh, the U S version of Sherlock Holmes, uh, Lucy, and it has Johnny yeah. Lee Miller and Lucy Liu, uh, which b- believe it or not, I, it's very, it's sort of, uh, predictable cause it's a, obviously a crime sort of serial, uh, thing, but it's, it, it's just, it, I don't know. It like, I, I am enjoying every single episode cause it's never what you expect. And it's sort of, it's very close to what a Sherlock Holmes mystery would be. Uh, and, uh, I definitely recommend, uh, checking that out. Um, what I'm also watching is, uh, I found, I found this sort of documentary. I don't know if you guys had seen it or talked about it. Uh, it's called everything or nothing. And it's actually sort of the, the, uh, behind the scenes story of the James Bond franchise. Uh, oh, and yeah. I watched that actually. That, that was good. Yeah, I, I I was amazed at sort of like I I I heard about it or something like that, and then I saw it on, on Netflix, and I was like, yeah, you know what, I'll check it out, and it was absolutely amazing. They have every single. Uh, Bond uh, in there, except for Sean Connery, but, but you do have sort of archival footage of uh, Sean Connery to, uh, in interviews and stuff like that talking about it. But uh, um, it's sort of like a really, really cool in-depth look of what the James Bond franchise uh, has been from Ian Fleming all the way up to uh, present day with uh, Daniel Craig. So I, I definitely recommend uh, checking that out. Cool pick. Uh, Lamar, I know you're going to make yes. a lot of people in our audience happy because you're watching at least three of these things that you've listed are things people in our audience have been beating us up to watch uh, that we <laughs> haven't had a chance to. Yeah, I, I, I kind of go off the fringe a little bit, but I'm really enjoying Revolution right now. And I, I know some people say it's not the best acting. And has but it gotten I, better? I just it, thought it was it, predictable. I, I, felt, I felt it has. They, they've had a lot more more drama to it. You know, I, I don't want to spoil it, any of it, but you know, a, a lot of a lot of events are now mm-hmm. unfolding, kind of in, in a lost scenario, which is funny because right. the, the, the the lady that was on a lost is yeah, is Juliet. One of the, yeah, Juliet's one of, one of the stars on it. I, I like and this. Bella's because, dad. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I I like this uh, series because it's it's one of those scenarios like what would. What would we do in a in a situation like this? It's it's very uh to me it feels very kind of realistic, except for the fat guy who's been fat for fifteen years, uh, and he's walked and he's walked thousands thousands and thousands of miles, yet he's still the same size. That does not give the effect. That does not give me hope <laughs> for myself <laughs> at all. Uh, um, another show, probably my favorite right now, is Kevin Bacon's The Following. Absolutely love this show. Uh, this cult leader who's a mur- murderer is, uh, you know, is trying to be caught by Kevin Bacon. Kevin, Kevin is fantastic in the show. Uh, it, it's, it feels like 24 to me. Like it feels like only a few days have really co- gone by, even though it's been about six, seven episodes, I believe, maybe a little bit more. And I, I like, I like that feeling of, of continuity that it doesn't break from show to show. So check that one out. Um, I'm watching Psych, which is a, I mean, if you love comedy. Psych is the show to watch, I, I say for sure. Um, the one that I'm having difficulty with is Once Upon a Time. I want to love it, but the acting is getting progressively worse. But I, I feel like I've invested so much time into it that I don't want to leave it. But, I hate uh, that too, where it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, I yeah. can't quit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's I, I like fantasy. I like, you know, I like, you know, those kind of stories, how to tie it in fairy tales. But it's yeah, the acting is, is getting progressively worse. So I, I don't know what I'm going to do with that show. 
Brian, uh, obviously Game of Thrones. Still watching Doctor Who? <clears throat> yeah, this time I sort of phoned it in. Like, uh, like the kids are really enjoying watching Doctor Who. And, and you know, this was another Monster of the Week episode. I mean... I, it was it, it was a it, it was soft for me. I, I it was the obligatory trip it. into history episode, and frankly, I never liked those very much. So this is a, was a better one than usual, and you had Davos Seaworth. Uh, yeah, okay, that, as well as I, I Edward Tully. Yeah, right, exactly. Well, uh, so uh, uh, but the cute thing was watching it with the kids. Like this was legit like the scariest horror movie thing they'd ever seen, and so they all cuddled together with me, and you know, so oh, so experience. I forget. That I watched this stuff, you know, when I when I was their age. So it's it's cool to see it through their eyes. Uh, I I'm not going to have time to stick around for a spoiler zone, but uh, but I did want to talk. I think this is spoiler free. Uh, Game of Thrones ended with uh, a very unusual choice on the music at the end. Can we talk about that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Now, Lamar, did you watch Game of Thrones? I know Steve said he did. I don't watch it, so you won't be spoiling it for me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, the Bear and the Maiden Fair. Is a is a classic song from the Song of Ice and Fire universe. People know it from the books. People have already recorded it before the TV show ever came around, and they've they've sung it in the show a couple times. But they got a uh, they got a group to actually record it, um, like an indie rock version for the show. Uh, and and what was it? It was it was f- that, what was the name of that that group? I uh, I had. Noted but whatever. It Some, somebody will have a link to it in the chat room in about two seconds. Um, but but so now this particular episode ends with a with a big surprise moment, right? And it's uncomfortable to to look at and and shocker it, moment. They wanted they wanted to have a shocking the whole study is the name of the band. There you go. There you go. But uh, but so th- this episode ends with a big shocker. And what they said they wanted to do was create, uh, you know, throw you off kilter with it. Um, by by all of a sudden throwing an indie rock pop version of the Bear and the Maiden Fair for the credits to roll. Uh, all of that makes sense, hypothetically. It also undoes so much work that they've done to create a consistent, believable world with Game of Thrones. They have gone so far out of their way to do everything correct. It, it felt wrong and stupid, the same way seeing a three-eyed crow in New York City flying around during those promos felt like like wow whoever made that ad doesn't get the show you know because that's not imagery out you know that that they do and but now apparently they do i mean it's like it makes as much sense if they if they had just played you know led zeppelin at the end of it it, it i i did not like it at all it just took me right out of it I will say this. First off, I would love to have Led Zeppelin play at the end of Game of Thrones because that just would be amazing. Uh, favorite band all time. Uh, but the, th- the thing is, it's different. Like, interesting is that, uh, okay, I work for a-, a company that actually owns rights to HBO uh, Canada. Um, so I actually, uh, I-, I get the screener copies uh, from work uh, of of the of each show on HBO. And uh, I actually watched... This episode and it didn't have the song, and ah. it was it was the most shocking thing I'd ever like I'd ever seen. I'm like, uh, 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 like it was like I, I had to actually look it up the, the song today, or at least, and I was like, wow, that does seem like it would be very jarring. Um, but to me, it just it was like it didn't need that punctuation. Let's just say that. I'll okay, admit it was real, jarring. Oh. But I liked it. It reminded me of like a flogging Molly or Dropkick Murphy's take on a classic Irish tune. And, right. and in that okay. respect, I kind of loved it because Jamie Lannister is rock and roll. And so, you know, you want to have you want to have some rock and roll there. Uh, people in the chat room are pointing out like, uh, well, you know, it, there's a, again, minor spoiler, you know, song all along the Watchtower shows up in Battlestar Galactica. That's a plot point. That is part of the story. Uh, that and it's important within the context of the story they're trying to tell. This does. Yeah. This is just tacked on and complete. And then you know, uh, Ken from Chicago says, "Well, well, what stylistically? Maybe it's just like uh, Heath Ledger in A Knight's Tale." It's like, no, that was the story that you did the whole way long. It was the vibe you were going for. This is not the vibe they've ever gone for. It, it, it's like a giant record scratch to uh, to what other up until this moment has been a fantastically consistent world and tone that they've gone for. And it just, it just yeah. threw me so off. So you're not watching game of Thrones anymore now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, you know, I love the show <laughs> way too much. I mean, it's like, it, it's fine. It's just, I'm like, that's just weird game of Thrones. You didn't need to do that. And you know, let's stick, stick to your, your strong suits. 
All right. Uh, my, what I've been watching is the stuff you've heard me talking about for weeks now. Mad Men, uh, consistent, not not crazy great, but if you like it, you're going to continue to like it. Uh, Game of Thrones, you know, had, I, I, as far as the show goes, the show amazing, ending credits aside. Uh, I enjoyed that Doctor Who episode, but I gave you my opinion on that. Orphan Black, I've been kind of watching on a delay, a self-imposed delay. I record it on Saturdays. I usually don't get around to it till Tuesday or Wednesday. And, of course, Archer... Uh, season finale so no more archer i'm very very sad because archer just had another incredible uh season but i wanted to talk one of the things i watched a lot of this week was the nhl and major league baseball on roku i paid for the mlb.tv and the nhl uh, center ice packets or game center or whatever it's called for the roku so when I want to watch my St. Louis Cardinals, I can watch them on my Roku. When I watch the St. Louis Blues, I can watch them on the Roku. Uh, and, and when my wife want to watch the Oakland A's, now we don't live in the market. We can watch them on the Roku. But we're blacked out of any Los Angeles area teams. And here's where it gets interesting. We don't pay for the tier of direct TV service that gets the local sports channel. So if the Dodgers are the only ones who ever seem to be on broadcast, oh. and that's only like two or three times a week, if, if, if we want to watch the local sports teams, we can't because we're blacked out from MLB and NHL. Uh, and we don't, we'd have to pay an extra $120 a year to get this Fox Sports Prime and Fox Sports West tier that has a, the, our actual local sports team. So blacking out the local sports team has actually decreased our ability to watch your local ads. It's not working for us. Wow. Sheesh. Yeah, maybe you should sucks. change. Maybe you should change your uh, home to Chicago or something, so they won't know. Well, and, and can, a lot of people are like, yeah, you can, you can VPN, you can do this. I'm like, that's not the point. I actually don't really care about watching those games unless they're playing the Cardinals, or the A's, or the Blues. Then, right. then I care. Uh, but most of the time, I don't care at all. But I just think it's funny. It's like they black them out to encourage me to go watch them on TV, so that I give ratings to the local market. But it's actually yeah. having the opposite <laughs> effect. I'm less likely to watch. Those games now. Yeah, that's I know for a fact that if any uh, local network here blocks any hockey from Canada, you know there's going to be a riot in the streets. I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> you've seen what we did in Vancouver. We that's that's nothing compared to if you take away our hockey from us. Joke around with that stuff. I know. Uh, no, so God, we, no, no. We should before we talk about what we're watching give a shout out to um, uh, Defiance. It either it, does it start tonight? Is that what it is? Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. I did have a note in the uh, in the movie draft section because that's sort of our premiering this week. But yeah, starting tonight is Defiance Sci-Fi Network uh, thing. It, it takes place in St. Louis, right? That's why uh, I got, that's why I came here. I'm doing my show on the location of an apocalypse. For sure. And the video game takes mm -hmm. place in San Francisco, so you can play the video game and watch the TV show. Uh, and and it's got lots of good advanced reviews, so I'm definitely going to check it out. That's awesome. Uh, well, Brian, you got the hard out, so you decide. Do we want to get into any feedback, or are we done? I'll tell you what. Uh, I will bow out now. You guys can carry feedback uh, without me, and uh, because basically I just collected. Remember last week I, I said, "Look, am I the crazy one with 4K displays?" And we collected a uh, a whole bunch of stuff. So let's let's go ahead and, and kick it over to feedback. Okay. Uh, now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Do you have a summary line for this before you go? Uh, like, wait, somewhere like, I mean, it's the, the responses are all over the map. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, here, let's just dive into a couple of them. Matthew says, let me explain my excitement. Uh, I have a 47 inch 1080p TV. When I watch blue Blu-ray, I pull my easy chair to approximately seven inches from the screen or seven feet from the screen. Maybe might as well be seven inches. So I can sit a little closer before being too close. He wants a 70 inch 4k TV so he can sit three feet back, basically, 10 or feet show, so from the screen and feel like he's at a movie theater. Um, no, if what you wanted to do, Matt, was feel like you're in a movie theater, you'd watch it in 2K because that's what you watch when you go to the movie theater. Mm, interesting. Eric says the problem with 4K TV is that it's still at a 16-9 aspect ratio. You're still going to see bars at the top and bottom when watching a movie with the aspect ratio of 241. Unless TVs start being produced in a higher aspect ratio, 4K TVs are worthless. That was true of HD TVs, too. That, that could eventually be fixed. Yeah, 
Uh, Andy says, uh, Brian, I'm a programmer. I use this as a way to justify my monitor addiction. I would totally go for a 4K screen and then put up my two larger monitors on the sides of it in portrait mode for a little extra desktop space so things don't feel so cramped. Here's what I love about this. He starts off making a very cogent argument that like, yeah, I need a giant 4K display so I don't have to have so many monitors. And when I get my 4K display, I can keep putting more monitors around it and make it even bigger, which is like, I love it. That's ballsy. And then we got David with a 135-inch screen in his home theater with a digital production three-chip projector. So he's like, yeah, totally want 4K for my 135-inch screen. Yes. yes, we understand you would want that. That makes for perfect For a blind sense. man, the 135-inch screen, that would be amazing. <laughs> slobber, slobber, slobber. In that case, do you even, but if you're blind, you don't, I mean, do you even care if it's 4K? Uh, actually, I do. Uh, I watch a lot of, uh, I have an HDTV and it's great and it works fine, but I still have to sit within about less than three feet away from the screen in order to be able to do it. And I've been doing this for all my whole life. So I've, I've never known anything beyond that. Um, uh, but seeing a four, like a, when I actually had a chance to see a 4k HDTV, I was like, I could see like, it, it, it like, uh, uh, I felt so like, I, I like, it was like that song is like, I was blind, but now I see, uh, and wow. it just was, the, the quality was amazing. I want, I want that so badly. That oh, may awesome. be the best use case yet. Absolutely. Right there. Mm -hmm. you just well, that is, uh, right. That's going to wrap it up for us. Uh, thank you, Steve Saylor, co-founder, co-host of this week in geek. Tell folks where they can find your show online. Uh, you can be able to go to thisweekingeek.net. We have uh, tons of great podcasts on there. And uh, don't worry, we're not part of the, the, the This Week End or whatever. We had that name a long time ago. Leo gave us permission, so it's totally fine. Uh, it's and like you This can Week also in find Baseball. Me. Pre -day yeah, exactly. Uh, you can also find me at Steve Saylor on Twitter uh, and uh, stevesaylor.net. And it's Sailor, S-A-Y-L-O-R, for those on the audio podcast. Uh, also, yes. big congratulations, Lamar Wilson, on the launch of This Week in YouTube, twit.tv slash YT. Where else can folks find you, Lamar? Thank you so much. You can actually find me on YouTube, if you like, at slash Lamar Wilson. That's Lamar with two R's. And uh, on Twitter at, at Lamar Wilson. So, uh, Stan, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. That's it for us. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR for frame rate. You can also email us frame rate at twit.tv and catch us live. Uh, we're every Monday, 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Our thoughts go out once again uh, to the folks in Boston. Stay safe. Really? Oh, is that what you want? Yeah. Like Milton Berle. Yeah. Sweet old Korean lady. Yeah. Are there more bad guys behind me? Oh, is that how you want to play it? Yeah.